evening, everyone, and welcome to this UEA London lecture um, at which we're announcing the establishment of um, the Anglian Centre for Water Studies. Um, so this is a strategic relationship between Anglian Water and UEA. My name is Victoria Danino. I am the head of this new centre. I hope you enjoyed the film that we were showing beforehand. It's a film that showed the potential, um, a potential water future. And it also relates to the issues that we are actually facing now um, in the UK. There's a future that's regarding scarce, scarce water resources. It's a future where the regulator um, has made some decisions that um, have affected those water resources. And these are some of the things that this new centre um, seeks to address. The centre is going to focus on four interlinking themes. The first is around climate change and how that might impact the amount of water available and the potential flooding. East Anglia is already one of the driest places in the country and with a long coastline, um, sea level rise and sea level flooding can become um, an issue. The second is looking at how the behaviour of each of us can impact water resources and pollution. Ellen Leder, who's one of the PhD researchers um, at UEA, has um, been using some psychology approaches um, to change how Anglian Water are promoting a water saving scheme to their customers. And the, the results of the first trial of this showed that just by changing the wording on letter, they have a 50% increase in the uptake of that scheme. So these are the kind of things that we want to be seeing happening through this collaboration. Ensuring environmental and economic sustainability is at the heart of the, the circular economy theme of the centre. Tonight you'll hear about um, environmental economic approaches and changes in farming practices and how they can reduce inputs into the water system. But the centre will also look at how Anglian water can make sure there is no waste and how the supply chains needed to develop a circular economy can be developed. And finally, UEA research will continue to inform policy in a changing world of opening up markets, regulation and competition. And again, we'll hear more about that later. But first I'd like to introduce David Richardson, Vice Chancellor of UEA, to say a few words about the impact of this centre on UEA. Thank you. Well, hello again and welcome everybody. There's lots of familiar faces in the audience and, and, and some new faces. And of course, this is uh, one of our UEA London lectures, but it's a UEA London lecture that is coupled to this wonderful occasion of the launch of the Anglia Centre for Water Studies. Um, it's really very exciting to be here at this launch, uh, to be amongst some of our alumni, but also to be amongst policymakers and industry colleagues. And, and I know that we all have one thing in common, and that is really a joint interest in uh, the long-term challenge of ensuring stable water supplies, not just for the east of England, where I live and some of us live, but also for the UK uh, uh, and the world at large. Um, and I think that the uh, Anglian uh, Centre for Water Studies is going to be a really important part now of tackling this major challenge ahead. Now, Many of you know a lot about UEA, and you know that we have a proud record of research excellence. And that actually, that proud record of, of research excellence is built on interdisciplinarity. That's the foundation on which we were built in an interdisciplinarity that has enabled to do research that has made a difference to society and to economies and to the world uh, more globally. And we do this through collaboration. We have an experience and a history of collaborating around water research. We've had a long-standing uh, uh, water Security Research Centre at UEA, and I think we have a number of colleagues from that Water Security Research Centre here this evening, Professor Bruce uh, Langford uh, and, and the new uh, Director Davo Guan. And this centre established a significant body of work on the global long-term availability of water and how it's affected by impacts of climate change and, uh, and, and global policy decision making. And now we add to that this new Anglian Centre for Water Studies, which will collaborate with the Water Security Centre and complement it as well. And we're going to hear about interdisciplinarity tonight. We're going to hear from the Centre for Competition Policy. We're going to hear from our School of Environmental Sciences, which was built on a foundation of interdisciplinarity. And the work of the Anglian Centre for Water Studies itself, itself will draw on research not just from those 
centres and departments, but from many others around UEA. We estimate that it could involve staff and students from at least 10 schools of study in the university, if not more. And that's really hugely exciting. It's going to encompass studies in areas like the psychology of behaviour change, the behaviour change that's going to re be required to help us to uh, sustainably use water in the future. The economics of understanding the value of water as a resource and its impact also on issues such as biodiversity and the best way to engage with society to drive the sustainable use of water. These are all important topics and they're important topics which a single <coughs> discipline cannot sort alone. It requires collaboration. Universities though, of course, are also about our students. And uh, many of you here were our students once, and you know how much we value our <coughs> students. And I think another thing about the new centre is that actually <coughs> it's going to be a centre which will actually also bring in industry, bring in the water industry into our teaching programmes. So our students can actually benefit through their courses from the expertise that the centre will bring together from around the UK. And through that then, we'll be training the future people uh, who are going to be contributing to the solutions that we have facing us around water in the future. The future generation of scientists and researchers across disciplines that we need and that universities can produce. So it's a wonderful opportunity, it's a wonderful occasion. I'm hugely proud for UEA to be part of it and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this centre as we progress through this evening. But I mentioned students. And one of the key people behind the centre is a UEA uh, alumnus, Chemistry 88. <laughs> and he's Peter Simpson, the CEO of Anglian Water. And I'm going to hand the floor to him now. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for that. There's nothing like getting one of these badges to make you feel really old, <laughs> is there? Um, it's interesting, I, I was reflecting back, and some 30-odd sort of years ago, I was a, a young chemist in a laboratory at Whittlingham Labs, which used to, used to be a laboratory based there in Anglia. And uh, I was doing some work, it was, it was in a summer vacation from university, from my uh, first degree. And there was a guy doing something much more interesting. I was doing all the basic tests, and somebody was doing really interesting <laughs> nearby. And I thought, I wonder what that is. And uh, I got chatting to him, and he said... Oh, he said, I, I, I'm doing uh, some research for Anglian with the UEA. Um, and he told me about what he was doing. He was doing an MSc, and uh, the research part of the MSc had been sponsored by, by Anglian, and it was all to do with uh, copper on the bottom of boats on the broads, if I remember correctly, and uh, copper contamination of the broads. Great bit of work, but it really inspired me, and that's actually why I ended up going to the UEA, to actually do the same course that he was doing. And that's one of the reasons I ended up working for Anglian, because off the back of that, I, was, I ended up doing a research project for Anglian in the same way that he'd done. So, you know, my relationship with the university does go back a very, a very long way. In a strange way, it's one of the reasons I ended up being, uh, being part of Anglian Water and, and UEA has been part of me as well. Anyway, um, over that period, um, what's become pretty obvious is we've all done a lot of work together. Um, so we've been working as a company with UEA for, for many, many years in all sorts of different areas. Um, areas of economic regulation, lots of environmental science, lots of uh, work on climate change, one of our particular challenges. And um, I guess one thing that was missing with that is a bit of coordination and a bit of focus. And I think the Centre for Water Studies is really about bringing that coordination and bringing that focus. Because I think we can have a, a bigger impact together by doing that. So for me, that's what this is about. It's not establishing a new relationship. There's been a relationship there for, for many, many years. It's about bringing that together and <coughs> focusing it very much. And what are the challenges? Well, we've got very big challenges associated with a very fast-growing region and the impact of climate change. And a few years ago, uh, as a company, we recognised <coughs> that dealing with that on our own was not going to work. Uh, we started on this whole programme and campaign and philosophy, I suppose, uh, a love every drop. And what that really is about is saying that we, as just a water company on our own, can't deal with all of those things around. What we need to be able to do is to collaborate. We need to be able to drive change right the way through for communities and customers, but we need to work with lots of different sectors. And of course in the east of England, 
surprise, surprise, sectors like agriculture, pivotally important for us to understand when it comes to how much water is being used and how much water is available. So just thinking about these things on our own in isolation, glorious isolation was never going to work. Collaboration was the key. So that's really the journey we've been on, and we've been broadening and widening that collaboration over the last few years. To the academic side, um, I, I'm a great believer in science. I, I think the business that we are in is, is too important to be caught up in the emotional way that maybe some things are going in the, in the current world. Um, decisions that we take as a company really do affect people. Um, they affect the environment. So I'm not one of those people who likes to make decisions on the hoof. I'm not one of those people who likes to make decisions because that happens to be the, the mood music at the moment. I'm not one of those people who likes to make illogical decisions. That doesn't mean I haven't made all of those in the past, by the way, but I don't like to. <laughs> um, what I like to do is to see science. I like to see sound science underpinning our decisions. And that's very much what this is part of as well. To continue to recognise sound science really matters. So I'm really, really pleased to be part of uh, this new future. And I have to say, uh, due credit to, to Alex Plant here, on my right, because I think the original idea of bringing this focus was, was actually his and it wasn't mine. So credit to, you, credit to you, Alex. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. I'm, my, my next job really is to introduce uh, Philippa Forrester, who's going to take us through the rest of the evening. Um, after graduating in a degree in English from Birmingham University, um, she went on to work for the BBC. And it was in her time in presenting Tomorrow's World that Philippa developed an interest in environmental science and a degree in ecology and conservation at Burbeck College, University of London. So would you please all join me in welcoming, wel welcoming Philippa and the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's delightful to be here. Not uh, quite near my stomping ground, actually, as a uh, University of London graduate, but with the, such a wonderful panel and such a great discussion to be had. Um, I think it's a great collaboration, really interesting research surrounding it. Um, and so I will go on no longer but introduce you to our lovely panel. So we have Alex, who you've already been introduced to really on the end, Head of Regulation for Anglian Water, overseeing the opening up of the retail market for business customers, developing regulatory and competition policy approaches to upstream competition, liaising with Ofwat and the water industry, and you have any spare time at all? Not, not much. <laughs> what do you like to do in your spare time? Uh, so lots, lots of walking, a um, bit of running, doing a half marathon on Sunday. Okay. Well, hopefully going to complete. All that. <laughs> so you, fit, you, you managed to fit other things in. Yeah. And be uh, uh, enlighten us a bit more about your role tonight and your, uh, yeah, where um, you're coming from. Okay. Well, thanks, Philippa. I mean, just it, Peter's given a bit of a backstory to, to his engagement with water. I first thought about water issues probably about 15 years ago when I was working in the Treasury. Uh, and I was part of a, a great team that was called the Competition Regulation and Energy Team. And it looked across all the regulated sectors and the role that those sectors had in, in sustaining economic growth across the UK. Uh, and at that point, we were really rude about water in that team. It was considered to be the really boring <laughs> bit. You know, you turn the handle on price review, off you went, nothing much to see here. Now, I think the tables have turned completely. It's probably never a more interesting time to be involved in water, uh, never a more important time. Um, and I'd echo Peter's comments around the importance of sound science, and I would add that you also need sound economics. And bringing those two together is part of what I think the work with the sensor will, will really do for us. Soundness generally feels like a thing we should be pursuing. Um, and in addition to the challenges around climate change and population growth that Peter talks about, I think we face a, a range of really quite tricky, wicked issues, if you like, around things like uh, how environmental <coughs> protection measures will reduce the amount of water available for public water supply, how we deal with a, a, a range of aging assets across our asset base, uh, and actually some of those wider macroeconomic and political changes, like the impact of Brexit, both <laughs> socially, economically, environmentally, uh, and, and uh, financially. And, and indeed, the Trump presidency and what that may do uh, to change what had been a growing international consensus on climate change. The, these are issues that all affect what we do in the east of England. They affect the water sector as a whole, and they're very important for the UK's future. Um, they combine, I think, to pose real challenges to our ability to cope with floods in the future, to ensure sufficiency of water supply, 
uh, to ensure effectiveness of climate change mitigation measures, and in, in particularly, in fact, how we play our proper role in enabling sustainable housing and economic growth. Um, and at, at a more micro level, you mentioned the work on, on new markets. That's, we're actually a really interesting time in the water sector, which had traditionally been a very sort of vertically integrated monopoly structure. And now we're seeing new markets in various parts of the supply chain and more coming in the future. Um, so the real opportunity is to think differently about how services are provided uh, and how we can unlock innovation in, in the way we do things in the future. <coughs> but there are challenges there as well. New markets operating alongside natural monopolies, that's a really interesting place to be. And some of the work we'll be doing with Morton and colleagues will be looking at and exploring some of those issues. Um, it's fascinating <coughs> stuff, but it's tricky stuff. Um, and it's been challenging for regulators and policymakers in other parts of the supply chain to get those get the balance right across these, these different issues. I'll just briefly touch on customers. I think there's a real changing role of customers in the economy generally. Customers are becoming more demanding, rightly so. They expect great service, they expect great value for money. Uh, and the answer to some of our more intransigent challenges actually lies in working differently with our customers so that we think about how we can affect their behaviour which in the end makes the ability for us to deal with all those challenges more easy than it otherwise would be. And again, that brings in links to the UEA's work on demand side responses to those challenges. How best do we affect that sort of desirable behavior change? What's the right blend of financial and non-financial incentives? Um, and how do we get the engagement with customers right? And taking all of that together, um, I think this, you know, the launch today is a, is a, is a really fantastic a realization of, a, of, of an idea and lots of people coming together to make it happen. But most importantly, I think it will help the UK as a whole get to the right place, make the best use of water, recognize it as a precious and scarce resource, work with the constraints and opportunities of natural environment, enable sustainable housing and economic growth, and harness the power of our customers to deliver a more sustainable future. Well, sitting alongside you, you already mentioned Morton Vid. Nice to see you from UEA. Uh, head of the Centre for Competition Policy, and that centre incorporates economic, legal, management, political science, and sociological perspectives to produce, inter we've, we've, we've heard about interdisciplinary research into competition policy and regulation that has real world policy relevance without compromising academic rigor. <laughs> We're clear on that. <laughs> Absolutely. And in your spare time, you? Uh, I like to canoe on the Norfolk Broads and the, particularly the rivers. It would have been nice to be out there today in the lovely weather. But, uh, I like so things. much that um, you'll see a theme emerge with our panellists and, and being out in uh, talking about real world policy relevance, but real world human experience relevance as well. So, Morton, give us a little bit more of an insight into where you're coming from today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so just picking up this, the very long was our strap line on our website, and, uh, and it rather goes on a bit. But I want to pick up a couple of the words, we've already talked about interdisciplinarity, but policy relevance, because in order to ensure that research is relevant, we do need a dialogue, both with the public and the private sector. And we need that both in order to inform the research agenda, not to set it, but to inform it, but also to test the research, outcome of our research. You know, if we do something, I can go to Alex and say, does it make sense? And he'll say, no, <laughs> because, and we may have missed something completely obvious that we just didn't think about, and it's really important <coughs> not to do that. And academic rigor, to ensure that our analysis, analysis is rigorous, it must be open to peer review, and hence our aim is to make sure that our work is in the public domain, and that's an, another key, key aspect. Now, in terms of the work we've, we've done uh, in the past and currently at CCP, and that is directly or indirectly relevant to some of the issues that we're thinking about, this evening, uh, some of it is work on well-functioning markets where we have in the past looked at energy uh, and are currently looking at care homes, uh, which is important to, under to is willing to study and evaluate the introduction of competition in retail water, which we are seeing for SMEs uh, starting April 1st, I understand, and which might even happen for households in the future, we don't know yet. So that may help inform how we think about it because Water like energy has some complexities that is not shared with your standard industry. Second, there's work on consumer responses, um, one, which, uh, one of which is, is a recent report on remedies aimed at engaging consumers, which was produced for the Consumer Association by one of my colleagues, Professor Amelia Fletcher. Um, 
A number of the recent uh, market investigations by the, uh, by the Competition Authority has highlighted in sufficient consumer response. We are not active enough. If we are going to see more competition in retail, both for small, medium-sized businesses and potentially for households, we need to understand how we can have active consumers because without that, the project won't work. We have done a lot of work on, on vulnerability uh, in the past. We looked across different sectors and also e different EU member states to understand what to do about vulnerability, how to, to deal with it. And this, of course, is important because water is essential for life. And there's some really big issues there in terms of what will happen in the future, who is going to be affected. And this brings us on to some current work we're doing on justice and equity. You know, who gains? Um, and are these gains shared by all or do they fall on the few? And if you think about some of the things that have happened in the last nine months or so, a lot of this by some commentators are put down to the benefits of globalization not being shared out evenly. Um, and we have a, a research council funded project on this on equity and justice and energy markets. That's led by another colleague, Professor Wadhams, who is also uh, a, a non-executive director of, of what happens. Um, Indeed, just a very brief plug, our annual conference, June 15th to 16th, on just markets will explore exactly what markets can and cannot deliver. Now, the final thing I want to say is that CCP is currently undertaking some work with Anglian Water on the effect of price and non-price mechanism aimed at increasing water conservation by households. And this is interesting because you might, as economists, think, oh, well, we'll, we'll try and do it with prices. You know, increase prices, people will consume less. Uh, that way then bump into issues about vulnerability and equity and justice. And some of the work by and later that has been referred to suggest that there may be non-price ways of doing the same thing, or maybe they need to be combined. Hopefully we will know more about it in three or four weeks' time when we deliver the report. And that's sort of summary of a few things. Thank you. Mm. Moving on to catchment management then. Lou Guilfoyle from Anglian Water is uh, catchment management strategy manager and also Chartered Environmentalist of the Year. Yes. And <laughs> does a lot of work with slugs, or has done in the past, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> that is, I am always envious of my colleagues who get to work with ospreys and beautiful mammals. I get slugs and oysters. <laughs> <laughs> no, Valuable nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm here tonight to talk to you a little bit about some work that we have done with UEA, um, and it's an ongoing piece of work that we, we, we're working alongside them with now. So as Philippa mentioned, Anglian Water has a bit of a problem with slugs. And the reason we have trouble with slugs is that we operate in an area of huge agricultural importance um, and where there's a lot of wheat and all the seed grape grown, hugely important for the UK economy. And unfortunately, those crops and the soil type and the climate that we have makes it a really good place for slugs. And you cannot have viable agriculture unless you've got viable slug control. So the product of choice for killing slugs uh, is, is a product that contains the active ingredient metaldehyde, that some of you may have, have heard of. And metaldehyde is very difficult to treat. So in terms of conventional treatment, our conventional treatment processes are hugely effective over a wide range of pesticides, but they struggle with metaldehyde. <coughs> and we would be looking at having to put a lot of investment into different um, energy, uh, energy hungry, um, chemical hungry products to, to, to be able to address this through a conventional treatment approach. So much so that we could be looking at customer bill increases in, in, in the region of 21%. Clearly, that's not a place that, that is viable or a place that we want to go. So we're looking at catchment management and catchment management approaches to help us deal with these issues at, at source. So we approached UEA. Um, because we'd heard about their expertise on the economics of behavioural change. We knew they'd previously worked with the deaf for family with agriculture, so they had form, if you like. Um, we wanted to access applied research, really important for us to be away from the bench. Um, I'm a scientist, as all good scientists know, you, you plan your stats, you plan your methodology as, as, um, before you start your experiment. And we wanted a university and... and um, academic partners who could come with us on that journey and, and that's what we found, I'm pleased to say, at, at UEA. So the ask of UEA was to help us design a campaign and the campaign's called Slug It Out, some of you might, might have heard of that. Um, and 
UEA helped us to attract farmers to engage with Anglian Water regarding their slug control practices. I'm um, happy to catch up with people afterwards because there's an awful lot of facts that you wish you never knew about slugs um, that we, we now hold. Um, but it is really key to understanding the problem and seeing it from the farmer's perspective. Um, and they were helping us uh, through this campaign um, uh, to understand how you can change existing farm practices, so change existing uh, options to using alternative products that are less soluble, for example, uh, and therefore pose less of an issue from a water perspective. They also helped us in terms of understanding how to incentivise farmers to think about themselves as producers of clean water. Um, but the big piece that we wanted is we wanted, and we've heard this previously, but we wanted credible and robust information. So the outputs of this work had to be solid um, because one of our aspirations is to share that data with the wider sector, but also to share it with those who make policy and make regulation, and that is really, really important to us. Working with UEA has allowed us to get that, that gravitas around our research. So in terms of what it's allowed us to do, it's given us this wonderful data set. We're just coming to the end of our second year of Slug It Out, um, and we're making this information available to, to the bodies that, that are interested in the bodies who want to use it. It's helped us to understand the implications of removing the agricultural inputs of metaldehyde over large areas of land and really getting to the bottom of what that means in terms of water quality and the practicalities of doing this kind of work. Uh, it's allowed us to explore the feasibility of alternative options to just increasing customers' bills. We know that's not going to be popular or possible, so well, we have to look at alternatives, and this has been a really good example of how that might work. And it's allowed us to gain a better understanding of agricultural activity in our region, which has helped over a wide range of things. So we're not just talking about metaldehyde, we're talking about agriculture per se, and that relationship that we've built has been hugely important. Um, and the biggest thing that's come out of it is it's allowed us to collaborate closer than ever with that agricultural sector. And they really are key players for us in the Anglian region. And it's allowed us to start to co-create and co-develop solutions, whereas you know, two years ago, three years ago, we would have been looking at dealing with these on our own. And that's what UEA has brought to this particular piece of work. Thank you, Lou. Great insight into how we're driving the innovation forward with robust research. Kevin is by your side. Kevin Hiscock, Head of Environmental Science at UEA. Um, and your special interest has been the evaluation of the production and consumption of nitrous oxide in groundwater and the contribution by aquifers of this greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. I know also that you love wild swimming. And I think the, the wild being where you're swimming as opposed to your swimming style. Yeah. How do we keep your swimming water clean? Well. I could say in a corny way that I'd like to submerse myself in my research. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also a UEA um, graduate, uh, Peter. In fact, uh, I can beat you. I'm a nth graduate from 1979. And what's nicer than that is that um, Phil Alders also is an M79 alumnus and he's here in the audience too. So we'll go back quite a long way, Phil and myself. And my involvement in catchment science, though, is more recent uh, and particularly uh, started back in 2010 when DEFRA uh, awarded UEA a two million pound contract to research diffuse pollution problems in the east of England, particularly in the Wensum catchment, which uh, in North Norfolk is very impacted by runoff of sediment and phosphorus uh, and nitrate. And that very much accorded with my themes previously in terms of investigating nitrogen cycling in surface water and groundwater. And DEFRA um, threw down a single question, can we actually reduce diffuse pollution but at the same time maintain a, you know, a viable and productive agricultural economy? And it's a bit of a difficult challenge because A, we don't fully understand how catchments work and secondly, we have to try and convey our understanding to a wide stakeholder group to get them involved in finding a solution. So there were two prongs to this research, one the natural science element but also the social science element to translate our work uh, in a wider audience, particularly the farming audience, in order to try and get a discussion going around, as we were hearing from Lou here, how can we reduce metaldehyde? We do need to speak to the farmers and get into a dialogue and work together to solve what we might say in, in research terms is a wicked problem. Trying to reduce diffuse pollution is not an easy task. If it were, we'd have solved it a long time ago. And it's a problem that occurs in other parts of the world where we have intensive agricultural production, so Western Europe, North America, uh, Eastern China. These are big, um, arable uh, centers that are producing a lot of food, but 
at a cost to the environment. So the first thing we did was to set about installing monitoring equipment, and that was quite unique uh, in that we were installing equipment to measure nitrate and phosphate on a 30-minute resolution continuously uh, through a telemetry system that still runs today and has been doing so continuously since April 2011. So we have a very clear understanding of how our catchment in, um, in the Wensum works. And then once we had that knowledge, we began to then explore measures that might mitigate uh, nitrate leaching and phosphorus loss. And we were lucky to hook up with a, a leading farmer in, in North Norfolk, Paul Hoberson, at Saul, and uh, he was broad-shouldered enough to want to engage with UEA to experiment with some newer techniques uh, and try and introduce those techniques into the commercial uh, farming practice at Saul. And that was unique to the research too. Previous research had been very controlled in plot-type experiments, but there we were as a bunch of researchers trying to you know, pursue our research through a commercial farm. So we um, found it very useful to have a, a knowledge broker, a retired farmer, who translated our science into a language that the farmer could understand so we could then get into a conversation to start the mitigation work. And we've been mitigating nitrate through using cover crops to soak up the, the nitrogen uh, after the harvest, that residual that's left in the soil. We've been using reduced cultivation methods to try and um, preserve the soil texture and to avoid sediment loss, and with that, the attached Phosphorus. We've worked on the farm with a bio bed to improve uh, the wastewater uh, in terms of reducing the pesticide concentrations in the wastewater before discharge to the ground. And we've also conducted some economic analysis of whether or not these measures will uh, add up for uh, a benefit to the farmer in terms of reducing the farmer's loss of fertilizer. No, no farmer wants to waste their fertilizer down the drain. Uh, it's expensive stuff. So if they can save that, we also improve the uh, environment. We've also worked successfully with Anglian Water, uh, both in terms of that biobed experiment, uh, but also in a modelling exercise in the Wensum where we've used the SWOT model, the leading model, and we've looked at different ways of handling and uh, applying metaldehyde in various scenarios. Can we do some risk mapping? Where can we apply metaldehyde where it's less risk? Other areas too risky, don't apply it there. So we've had a good engagement with Anglian Water in some aspects of this uh, DEFRA funded work. Um, but the knowledge exchange aspects cannot be underestimated. There's no point in me publishing peer-reviewed articles if I can't translate the work uh, with the farming community. And uh, we've had some good workshops and um, some good uh, breaking down of the jargon. And with that, we've been able to move forward together. And I've learned a great deal from the farming sector. I have to take my hat off to the farmers. They produce a lot of food very efficiently. And they're very technically minded in East Anglia. And I've become... Well, I was a hydrogeologist once. I'm now a farmer, I think. So I've been on a journey, too, in the last seven years. It's a bit like um, being a television presenter. You keep changing jobs. Oh, right. <laughs> but certainly that interdisciplinary approach is one that I uh, yeah. have adopted and, and would uh, hold to. So that's uh, Great. where I am presently. Thank you, Kevin. Moving on, Jean Spencer is Director of Regulation and leads the Water Resources Long-Term Planning Framework at Anglian Water. Resilience is your buzzword, I think, isn't it? Is that fair to say? I, I think that's right, uh, Philippa. And in fact, um, what I should say is that uh, I've recently been chairing not just for Anglian Water, um, a national project looking at long-term water resources, a riveting read, uh, available in every uh, website. And on, yeah, online. <laughs> and online. <laughs> And actually, my reward for that is that uh, I'm changing roles. So uh, Alex is far too modest to uh, say that he's about to take over as regulation director, and I'm going to focus on um, strategic growth and resilience. I'm not quite sure if I've got the words in the right order, but it includes all those, those things. Um, and just say a few words about resilience and the key role that working with UEA will have in uh, delivering resilience for us in the region and, and nationally as well. Um, I think what we, I mean, you know, as uh, having lived in, uh, in the um, east of the region, many of you, we are low-lying, uh, topography, low rainfall, long coastline. The Anglian region is one of the driest in the country, two-thirds annual average rainfall. The research from the, uh, the national work shows that we, as uh, the Anglian region, but nationally are facing a higher risk of, uh, to, of drought. 
Uh, that risk is exacerbated uh, by uh, climate change that trebles the risk of drought in the east of England. And the work of the Security uh, Research Centre is invaluable in informing that understanding of the risk. We also need to reduce abstraction to protect the environment, uh, low flowing rivers, um, uh, chalk streams, uh, wetlands, and also we need to be able to enable growth in the region. And so the modelling shows uh, nationally and regionally that there is a clear case to invest in addressing that risk and the benefits outweigh the costs. But often supply options are seen as the easy answer. Let's go and build something. But actually we need to look first and foremost at how we make the best use of the water that we have and how do we reduce demand and reduce leakage. And we're really excited about the work that we're already uh, uh, working on with UEA on that challenge of reducing demand. There are lots of views, you know, all of you in the room will have a different view about uh, the ability to reduce demand uh, through interventions. But actually what we need is evidence to inform policy and that's where the UEA has a key role to play. So can tariffs and price signals really incentivise people to use less water? So where have such tariffs worked internationally and would those approaches translate to the east of England? And that was the work that Morton has mentioned. How can we work with customers to uh, encourage them to use less water? What information do they need? What messages will work? And that's where the behavioural science team uh, will be able to guide us in apply applying the latest science. And so it's uh, really important that uh, invaluable that we're going to be able to work uh, together on on looking at resilience around water resources, but then how do we uh, work on making the most of the water that we have? Resilience is also about uh, floods as well. So the government pu published last year's National Floods Resilience Review, which acknowledged that there are obvious benefits to managing water in a way that reduces flood risk and water stress. And again, that's an area where tricky issues to resolve and how can we work with uh, UEA on helping us meet those challenges. Thank you, Jean. So it gives you a, a, a broad view then of the kind of uh, expertise that we've got and the idea with this collaboration is, as we've heard, to promote better understanding of the challenges and options ahead of us and to drive innovation. Um, and I'm hoping now to throw, uh, throw the mic out to you, not literally, but it will come to you if you want it, uh, to see if anyone's got any questions for our panel. Now, you've heard a little bit more about their areas of expertise and what their aims are. It's a broad base of expertise we've got. So any questions, if you could stick your hand up, wait for the mic. We've got one just here at the front. Um, and it'd be great if we can hear who you are and who's um, your question <coughs> for. I'm uh, Robert Tacker. I did my PhD in East Anglia. I think before most of you actually went to East Anglia. <laughs> um, great place. Uh, I think maybe this is more for Morton than anyone else, is the, a problem we have with a fragmented water industry in the UK, and uh, there are really large national companies from Germany and France um, taking over some of these. Uh, but then off what seems to have struggled to make them repair the leaking pipes, which I believe is an enormous loss of water, uh, and getting them to do things that we want them to do when all they're interested in doing is repatriating the profits. Is there any way that we can make this work better for UK water supply? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Should I start? Yeah, I know yeah. Jean wants to answer Yeah, while well, well you think about what we do about it, uh, just on leakage, uh, I think there's been enorm there have been enormous strides. I think one thing to say about the east of England is that uh, Anglian water uh, has half of the average level of leakage uh, of, of other companies uh, per kilometre. So it's something that in the east of England, given our water resource challenges, is something we do focus on. Uh, very much. So I'll go to Morton from a national perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not some, it's something we've seen in, 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 other, in other utilities as well, this, this uh, foreign ownership. 
And it's, it's not really ownership that's the big issue. It's the issue of, of the regulator and what the regulator does with these companies. And it's, it's what happens with price reviews, etc. So, so I, don't, I don't think there's necessarily an, an issue there that they're not able to deal with because it's been dealt with in other sectors too. That, uh, one, one further point. I think one of the things that's happened over the last, um, last price review and particularly moving into the next price review, the five-year review of, of company prices, is that the focus on customers and actually trying to respond to what customers most value from a water company has become a much bigger element of what then drives value back into shareholders. So actually we saw in the last price review in Anglian Water our customers telling us that they really, really valued the leakage issue. It was something they wanted to see us really crack down on. And so we went beyond the levels of leakage that were sort of recommended, you know, right, in order to respond to that customer feedback. And should we get the same sort of message again in this next price review? It's something I imagine we would continue to do. And, and the regulator, I think, is putting more and more focus on ensuring that the regulatory system actually is informed by what comes out of good customer engagement. And that's actually, I think, to be applauded. I would also just add to that, that in terms of, of observing the firm behavior when it comes to leakage and other things, I think will help in terms of the, the sort of remedies you want to put in place in order to reduce uh, demand by, by customers. Mm. Because if they think, you're, if they think the company's mm. taking it seriously, they're much yeah. more likely to take it seriously. If, if the company just says, well, it's your problem, you've got to spend, you know, you've got to use less water, you know, not, not let it run while you brush your teeth or whatever, then that's not, you know, it, there is two sides to that, and, and, and mm. consumers see that. And, and I think firms are aware that there is this damage. Mm. Thank you, Morton. Uh, there's a question just at the back there. <coughs> well, not right at the back, kind of halfway through <laughs> that back area. <laughs> it's actually, it's really hard for me to see... Yes, that the right, top <laughs> right. Yes. So if anyone is desperate to ask a question on the top right, I will not see your hand shoot up. So I'll kind of trust you, Holly, to let me know. Hello, um, I'm Jeremy Clayton, late of the Department for Business Innovation and Skills, now on UEA Council. Um, I'd just be interested a bit about the um, potential international agenda for the centre. Um, I'm conscious that uh, there's relatively quite a lot of uh, development-related research and innovation money that's becoming available from the government, uh, and also technology hubs being now recently announced, being set up around the developing world, as well as with places like Israel. Um, is this an opportunity that you will be looking to, to take to address, for example, water challenges in the Jordan Valley and other similar places around the world? Um, working with research councils, Innovate UK, uh, and using some of this bounty that has become available. Thank you. I think that is there a consensus that you're going to be answering this, Kevin? I think there was. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there there is. Is. Absolutely. It's like university challenge, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, yeah, very, very well made points. Yes, of course, we have uh, at UEA an international research agenda. This particular centre is more about the national water scene, but the UEA water security research centre does indeed have a more international profile. It's uh, within the School of International Development. That's not to say that uh, myself as a researcher, uh, I'm, I'm looking at those programmes, the Global Challenges Fund, for example, there are opportunities there. I mean, catchment science, the problems that I outline, they're the same in other parts of the world. Uh, working in an adaptive management way, learning from other catchment programmes, you know, it, it benefits me um, to work internationally. So we have similar problems in other parts of the world. If we can learn from those different uh, cases, then we will benefit our own work here in the UK. Um, but at present, as we start the new centre, we're looking close to home in terms of fixing our, our problems with leaking pipes, yeah. flooding issues, climate change pressures on water resources in, in the east of England particularly, um, but mindful that we can learn from international <coughs> examples. And, and, and hopefully actually spread that knowledge Absolutely. to yeah. international examples. No, I mean, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done globally, for, for example, on, on increasing block tariffs to, to get consumers to, to save on water. Some of this research is happening in the, in the US, some in Spain. And so, of course, we look internationally for, for evidence. We are trying to inform it, and then the, the challenge is to translate that into something that is relevant to the UK. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I just add one, one oh, thing, yeah. very quickly? Just th coming back to, to Jeremy's question, I think as 
the centre develops, and, and if it achieves the, the kind of what we want it to achieve in terms of the real enmeshing of some of these disciplines across economics and behavioural economics and environmental science, then the ability for the, for the centre to start to offer solutions that would potentially be applicable in other parts of the world and therefore attract international research funding is something I think we would want to keep in mind. Mm. Kevin's right that we're, we, we're, we're, we're birthing it today, but it's the kind of thing I would like to see happen, and I, I want the centre to be seen as, a, as an international source of expertise for tackling some of these, uh, these issues around, uh, that we face, and probably more acutely in, uh, in, the, in the developed world, in, in our region than in some others, which is why it's such an interesting place to be doing this. Mm. So, relevant certainly to long-term goals, longer-term <coughs> goals, we would say. Mm. Any question up there? Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name's Nina. I'm a, an e-commerce entrepreneur, uh, but I'm also an alumni of law from UEA 2007, so quite recent. Uh, my question is quite contemporary. So um, I've read a lot about Michael Burry and his recent research and global um, economic macro studies. And he cited uh, water as the next global commodity crisis for the world's economies. Um, how future-proof does the panel think the UK's water reserves are? And are we in a position of strength for global trading in the future? I think, go, go on, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that one. That's perfect, um, really. I don't think they're secure today. I think that um, we... Uh, in our water resource management planning, we, as companies, we all produce 25-year water resource management plans, but they're all based on delivering uh, and being secure against the worst historic drought. And uh, clearly, droughts in the future will be different. Uh, even without climate change, droughts in the future will be different. And we had a very near miss in 2012, where we'd had two dry winters, uh, London and the Olympics uh, was uh, very nervous. We put in host pipe bans, temporary use bans, uh, to, um, you know, to mitigate some of that risk. But if we'd gone through a third dry winter, we would not have been resilient and been able to maintain continuous supplies against that. So there are some real risks there that we're facing today. Uh, we have been very successful in the past about making the best of the water that we have. So we still put, and this is, isn't just Anglian water, it's across the country, we put the same water into supply today as we did 20 years ago. And in the Anglian region, you know, we've had a 29% increase in uh, uh, properties connected, um, and we still put the same water into supply. Uh, today as we did uh, 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago. But we, so we do need to take action to deal with those, uh, those future risks. And I think it's action on two levels. One is, uh, as I said, first and foremost, we do have to continue to drive down demand, you know, to make, to, you know, in terms of water efficiency, reducing leakage. And we also need to think, uh, differently about how we join up uh, future water resources um, and, and also flooding. So we're doing some work in the east of England in the Black Sluice about how can you join up. We put out, uh, we pump out to sea enough water a year to um, supply a million people. So how can we join up that flooding and that water resources? And the other area you need to look at is, you know, uh, is the potential for transfers of water between regions that have more to, to those who, uh, who need, you know, where the, um, the risks are on Scotland, uh, on according drought. to our fictional news reports. Yeah, <laughs> Scotland's a bit far, because water's <laughs> quite heavy, so actually, you know, from the Trent might be useful into, uh, in, into the east and Thames from the Severn, but... But, you know, how do we do that efficiently and when do we need to do that? Um, and so I don't think it's about not having enough water. It's about how we manage that water for the future um, and how we all value that water. If I can add to that, that's where the relationship piece comes in. So we've talked a little bit about agriculture, but when you're talking about moving water around, other key stakeholders understanding yes. the game. 
and understanding their impacts on the game is really important. And I think we've seen a, a real shift recently, more and more people coming to the table and wanting to talk and wanting to take part in, in, in what is water stewardship, because it's not just a water industry water industry thing here. We need more people to, to, to yeah. work together. So yeah. that, that has been a real positive change, I think. Yeah, and I think actually what I didn't mention is uh, what we have done that's pretty unique is we have something called Water Resources East, which joins all of the water companies together along with all of the other users of water, so agriculture, energy, um, uh, and, and the needs of the environment. And it's looking at what are the water resource needs of all of those users of water and how... Uh, again, how do we join up? Because water is local. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's in a catchment. It, it it's across the region. And so, how do we look at the, you know, the 25, the 50 year water resource needs for the whole of the east of England? And that's not just Anglian Water. That's all of those users. And that uh, work, Water Resources East, it's independently chaired by um, Henry Cater, that many would know, a landowner, but also chairs the uh, ADAS, the IDBs, uh, internal drainage boards and so on. And, and that's doing some really innovative work. OK, I'm going to move us on. Uh, Nina, I hope that answered your question. A question just down here towards the front. Do the hand up. Yes, stick your hand up again. There you go. Hello, my name's Hilary. Hi. I was a um, Dev 79. <laughs> um, I spent 13 years living in Zimbabwe and lived through drought and lived through um, the experience of toilets being flushed once a day in the city of Bulawayo because that was the only time, the, the only way there would be sufficient water to flush the system through. Um, I also spent time in Canada where there isn't a water shortage, um, but the toilets are um, suction. Many of the toilets are suction to uh, toilets. I don't know if that's the right description, but they don't seem to use a lot of water. And I'm interested to know whether you're uh, involving any design people, plumbing designers, building designers, so that the hardware that is put into housing is, mu is more efficient before mm. the people are converted. Um, you know, to their usage in the house, and also whether you're working with designers so that brown water can be used mm. and stored and used in gardens rather than yeah. tap water. Yeah. Well, we're talking toilets. Toilets. I love toilets. <laughs> and I, I, think, think... I think we all have an understanding of the requirements. <laughs> well, I think we're talking about water recycling in a way, and yeah. what we're touching on here is the... Um, the valuable resource that water is and how limited it is in the east of England mm. and recycling of that source indeed is one mm. of the themes of the, the new centre is to, mm. you know, the circular economy is the particular theme. Now, Alex is nodding uh, here vigorously, perhaps you might say a few things about how we might reuse water to, yep. to love every that, drop that brown to yeah. use your um, yeah. strap line. But we we <laughs> ought, to, ought to come back to the design element of the question mm. as well. Yeah, in well a minute. I'll, I'll go back to Jean in a yeah. minute, but, but absolutely <laughs> Kevin's right around the, the ability to think about the circular economy, which means mm. that you, you minimise waste, that you can reuse water, and you can actually get often closed loop systems which, which actually deliver what individual householders need, <coughs> but if, but with far less kind of waste going away. And actually, that's true in agricultural processes. We've done a lot of work. Um, actually, we've been, a, I think, a leading, a leading player <coughs> looking at how we work differently in agricultural processes, so you actually turn waste into a, into a valuable, uh, valuable resource, if you like. Um, and I think the same sort of thing is true in households as well. It, the only thing I would say just briefly before I hand over to Jean is that because of the rate of growth in the east of England in, in coming years, there's a lot of opportunities to think differently about how we design new communities. And we've got major new towns coming forward in, across the whole of the region. Rate um, of population growth. Yeah, you mean, big yeah. population growth. You've got new towns in places like Northstow and Auckenbury uh, coming forward. And if we see the Milton Keynes to, uh, to Oxford to Milton Keynes to Cambridge corridor beginning to be a major growth uh, growth corridor. Then there's going to be more new ha new new homes built, more new towns built, more garden cities <coughs> built, and with relatively uh, small amounts of, of additional thinking at the early stage about how you design those communities, mm -hmm. you can actually deliver more sustainable communities which actually make use of grey water um, and actually get a better, more sustainable 
environment for those communities. Now that doesn't solve everything because it, it's harder to retrofit existing properties than to design new. Is that, is that, is that part of and what was saying? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Jean and talk a bit about that <laughs> bit. And I know Morton wants to have a quick <laughs> well, I said just, Is I that mean, addition to what Alex is saying? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really picking up on, on, on the innovation that you talked about because what we need to make sure is that there are incentives to innovate. So somebody has to have the incentive to actually come up with these new ideas, to the new design. There has to be an incentive to take up these new things. And if we need to give the incentive to innovate, then they're not going to be cheap. Uh, and then we run into distribution issues as well. I mean, a lot of these things, those of us who are middle class or well off, and not, the not, not uh, just, just managing people. We can afford to put these in place, we can afford to respond to it, uh, but that may not give enough bang for the bucks, if you like. And so there also has to be some consideration about what does one do at the distribution and how do we make sure that a lot of these benefits actually end up with those who are just about managing or those who are vulnerable. And so there are some real challenges <laughs> there as well, which you know, we have experience of thinking about from other sectors. But this is part of the remit of the centre, I think it's part of what, what Hillary is getting at. Yes, yeah. the answer to that. And the, yeah, so and Jean, you would add on the design front, I hope? Yeah, um, so specifically, uh, firstly about uh, new developments, so building sustainable new developments where what we're uh, carrying out some pilots around because we need to understand the costs and the effectiveness and will it work in practice. But how do you go, it's not just grey water, it's black water recycling, so having effluent recycling at a development level where you take that effluent, you treat it, you have dual pipes that go back and you use that for flushing the toilets and potentially for outdoor use. So you're not flushing the toilet with drinking water. And so it, it, that in itself doesn't require behaviour change either. Uh, so behaviour change would give you benefits on the drinking um, on, on uh, water use as well. But it's how do we do that? But then who funds that? Because what we're very clearly understanding is that developers won't fund the, any additional costs. So the government is very focused on affordable new homes. And so the question there is, how can we work out you know, the economics of that? And, and is there a role actually for water companies and the wider customer base to help to uh, um, fund that or to put the incentives in place through lower infrastructure charges so that developers will take up those, those sustainable developments? So I think that's something we're actively working on um, and, and you know, looking to, to take that forward. Because I think, again, we can't get to having you know, that sustainable future and drive down demand for new water without picking those, uh, picking those issues up and, and innovation and doing things differently. I think on the water fittings, you know, things like toilets and, and all of that stuff. The hardware. Is the hardware, uh, water labelling, any of those things. Uh, I think we uh, are quite pessimistic of that at the moment being taken forward because it needs regulation. Um, the government doesn't want to uh, you know, pick up things that involve red, you know, increasing red tape. So you know, that water fittings regulations um, is something that's a challenge All at right. the moment. I'm just going to, we just have a few minutes left, I want to get to one more question in. Gentlemen up there, thank you. Uh, oh, Roy, pen, I'll just be warned we don't have long, no. if uh, everyone Roy gets a drink. 63. <laughs> no? And that's not my age. <laughs> <laughs> it's older. Um, a question which is prompted by comments by both of the UEA uh, delegates on the, on the table, who were emphasizing the importance of publishing in peer publications. Now probably the most, most highly developed commercial academic relationship is the one between Big Pharma and Biosciences Departments. And that relationship is littered with examples where Big Pharma has stood in the way of publication in peer-reviewed journals. What discussions have you had within the centre to make sure that those problems do not arise? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm thinking this is an interesting question. It makes me think about the relationship I have had uh, during the recent years with this catchment science programme. 
Um, the farmer that we work with particularly has said that he's removed a lot of baggage in talking to us as researchers at UEA, thinking how to do farming, perhaps um, chemically, but we've shown methods that are more environmentally sympathetic, reduced cultivation, for example, and so that individual has changed their thinking about how to manage the cultivation system on the farm that isn't driven by these big industry uh, interests. So for me, it makes me reflect on the need to um, influence, in terms of our research outputs, those advisors, that, uh, like agronomists, that help farmers in their day-to-day -day business. If we can influence them, often they're influenced by big business, but perhaps the researchers, we can influence them. So, so, so conflict let, at the let, heart of yeah, the I mean, collaboration. Absolutely, yeah, right question, absolutely right question to ask, and it was something that we spent quite a bit of time discussing as we set the centre up. We have a memorandum of understanding between us, which means that we try, we try through that to guard against those sorts of problems, sort of in the way we set the thing up in the first place. I think if we were dealing with sort of customer sensitive <coughs> data, we would be flagging that at the beginning. Actually, if there was, if there was stuff we were giving to Kevin or Morton or anywhere else which we, we were already constrained around, that would be clear on the way in and that would constrain the way that could be used because we have responsibility to customers around that. I think what's absolutely crystal clear in the way we've set the centre up is that we are interested in the independent thinking of academics within the University of East Anglia, hopefully bringing those together, and that actually what's published needs to be something that you can stand behind. It, this isn't a case, that, uh, frankly, it's no good to us if it's you telling us what we want you to say because that, that actually has no value. So that is clearly within the MOU. Think things like confidentiality of data, we would deal with perhaps on a slightly more case-to-case -case, case -case basis, but it would be clear on the way in. But, I mean, you're, you're quite right. So, so whenever I'm called up and somebody has an interesting research question that you would like me to work on, and I say to them, yeah, uh, I would like to work on that, uh, but... Uh, and we're going to publish it in the end, and you've got to live with whatever the outcome is. And mm. there's a silence at the end of the phone, and then it's, we'll call you back. Mm. And they don't, except, no, these guys have not done that. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very common experience, and I think one just have to, as a university, guard against it. I think mm. one thing that... I'm, I'm, some, I'm often nervous about the impact agenda, but I think it's one of the areas where this actually helps, because for us... It matters that our research of impact, we are being assessed on the impact of our research, and that research has to be in the public domain. And mm -hmm. so there is an extra value for us in order to have things published. And that gives us a strong impetus to say, you know, we're not going to, sorry, but you know, if that's, what, if, that's, if that's the deal, then we're not interested. Okay, and thank you. Uh, yeah. oh. Very briefly, because I really need to wrap it up. With, just going to say that um, that independence, so that, mm. that publication of data, that independent function is actually really, really important when we're trying to produce data to support regulation and policy setting. So in those kinds of circumstances, we would absolutely court that independent publication and that, that, that just wouldn't pose a, pose a concern to us. Mm. And I'm Kevin happy to Lassler. say that I've had two publications in the last couple of years that have involved authors from Angling Water, and indeed the farmer himself. So for me, that's been a great uh, outcome to have a mainline journal article with the stakeholders involved in the author list. So I'm very open to publishing with stakeholders. Great question to end on. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, I'm going to draw this evening to a close and say thank you so much to a fantastic panel. Um, Alex, Morton, Lou, Kevin, and Jean, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And if Victoria would like to come and wrap things up, I know that she's just got a few words to say. So I'm aware I'm standing between you and a drink, um, <laughs> so I'll be very quick. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening, and I hope that actually what you've seen is that the university staff don't hold all the knowledge in this relationship. That actually um, it's by collaborating, truly collaborating together, that we're going to generate new knowledge and drive new innovation. Um, and the knowledge held within Anglia Water is as important as that held within the university. And that's what we want this centre to show, um, that together we're going to drive innovation. So thank you for coming, thank you to the panel, and enjoy your drink. <laughs>